idea of stealing people is what we do, um, you're going to get a, a lot of information very, very quickly. This is uh, 30 years of experience in consulting, HR, outsourcing, and operations, all squished into an hour. And what we try to do is highlight the things that we've learned that have been the most impactful uh, with organizations that are trying to grow and need people. So how to build a waiting, waiting list of employees. I remember the very first time I had a CEO of a company call and say, Mark, I don't know how this happened. I know you've been working with us, but we have more people that want to get hired for a specific job than we've ever had before. And for the first time, we actually have the choice of who we want to hire as opposed to just doing the mirror test. You know, if they fog a mirror, then we hire them because we're desperate for people. So it's transformational for an organization when they get to the point where they can hire the best possible people. A lot of times we get focused on symptoms though when we look at talent issues in an organization. The cost of talent acquisition uh, is measured a lot of different ways. Uh, we can have excessive time to fill, that could be a symptom. We could have increasing salaries or bonuses, that could be a symptom. We're just at a low number of highly qualified people. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. We have candidates that sometimes disengage from the process, they just bail out. We call it ghosting in the industry. We don't know necessarily why, uh, but there's a whole lot of reasons that uh, show up as symptoms. But our typical corporate response is we got to focus on all these symptoms. There's all these different things going on and we want to put out those fires. And to make it worse, they're often siloed by department and we have limited internal solutions because of lack of perspective. And I would add that not having an enterprise perspective makes it even worse. So there's consequences of this and the consequences show up in a lot of different ways. When we hire poor talent, it just goes downhill from there. You probably have experience somewhere in your lifetime where you've had the wrong people get hired for the job. It increases total cost of operations in a lot of different ways. Production quality, timeliness, compliance and legal risk go up. You know, compensate, workers' compensation claims go up. Turnover, high vacancy rates, low productivity. Having an operations background, I can tell you that if this stuff is managed and monitored, then you're going to have scorecards that are showing up yellow all over the place. Just a, a quick question. How many of you have experienced or are currently experiencing these kind of employee recruitment or retention efforts? All right, well, that's almost everybody. Uh, right. Well, just making sure. I'm going to argue that the real cost to the organization is not necessarily to the business metrics that we frequently measure. Those are all symptoms. It's the impact of leadership because it creates stress for the leaders. They get pulled into firefighting on a daily basis. They get distracted from the high priority, high ticket, high impact things that are on their agenda as their priorities. And the opportunity cost is immeasurable compared to the measurable cost We'll call those indirect expenses, and these are more direct, very measurable. So the root cause, sometimes we, we look at it in terms of, can we not find the people, or can we not attract the people? Those are two very different issues. If recruiting says, oh, we found a lot of great people, but we haven't been able to hire anybody, then chances are we've got a failure to attract. The problem is not finding people. There's people everywhere. It's, they don't want to come work for you. Your company is not necessarily uh, the appealing organization that they're looking for. So typically in recruiting, we have what we call the post and pray method, where we post a job and we pray somebody good applies. Uh, and in many organizations, we also have sourcing, which is very time consuming. And now we have AI tools, all kinds of different ways to find people. But we're typically trying to convince candidates to come on board. We're throwing money at them. We're trying to find people that want to come to work. And we're convincing them that we're a great organization. But recruiting is just a job for most recruiters. It's not necessarily a mission. One of the challenges I see all the time is recruiters don't have the, the fire in the belly, the passion for the own organization that they represent. And so you know, when they're on the phone, they're just going through the motions. So do you have this skill set? How many years of experience do you have this? How would you handle this situation? And it's more like an interrogation from the perspective of the candidate. 
when you've got somebody who has a lot of passion, it looks really different. Attracting people is an entirely different set of muscles for a business. Your reputation is all online, whether you know it or not. A candidate can, we're gonna look at this, a candidate can go online and they can see uh, what's in your coffee shop, uh, in your break room. They can see the, the CEO's past history. They can see online lawsuits. They can see everything. The right messaging, however, attracts the right people. And we're gonna talk about how organizations are doing this today. When you attract candidates, you get people that are very highly qualified. They are talented, they want to come in, and for the right reasons. Frequently, they're a stronger cultural fit, not just a technical fit, because we want both. And we're not necessarily posting jobs online as job postings. We're posting opportunities. So if you ever have been to an Amway meeting, you know that they are talking about the opportunity to come on board and create a business for yourself, a legacy and income. Why don't we talk to candidates that way? How come we don't treat them like VIPs? Well, when we flip this switch and we start talking about what's important to them, we start attracting people and it's completely different. So what's the solution? Do we just throw more money at recruiting? We need another recruiter or we need more recruitment tools or is it we need to change our public reputation as an employer. I'm gonna argue that it's the latter. It's a lot cheaper too. Because when you fix that, it, there is a internal change and an external change. And when people come into the business, it's very, very different. So we're gonna talk about how we get to this point. <clears throat> One of the questions I frequently ask groups, especially C-level leaders, is when we look at the enterprise, there's something called an enterprise stack. It's a part of an enterprise architecture model that says we have people and process and materials and information and compliance and all these different elements that make up our business activity, business function. And I ask, what's the most important one? Out of all of those, what's the most important one? And a lot of times people will say, well, it's technology or something. But it's not, it's people. It always has to be people because people make the decisions that influence all of the other layers of the enterprise stack. So every other dimension of the organization is impacted. So if we get that one thing wrong, it's all gonna go sideways. So I'm gonna give you a, a comparison view of how things are typically done to where how we want to be. On the graphic on the left, we have all these candidates that have applied for a job. And typically what's happening is recruiting is scoring these folks, maybe one to 10, where six are very unqualified, 10 is super qualified. And so they got all these, these, um, these numbers, but then we also see that some of them want more money. So if we have somebody that's very low qualified, but they want a lot of money, eh, they're not even on the list. But if we find somebody that's super qualified and they don't want very much money, wow, you know, what a deal for the business. But what happens is we have a candidate pool that's limited. So we typically are making a hiring decision based on the strongest ranking candidate for the least amount of money. And if we can get that person, that's a win for the organization typically. So our focus tends to be in that upper right-hand quadrant. But look at the graphic on the far right. All those green circles, those are candidates that are not in the candidate pool on the left. Those are all the high performing, amazing people that didn't apply because your public reputation as an employer is terrible. Or they saw something that spooked them in the public sphere and they don't wanna to come to work for your organization. Or they actually read the comments on Indeed and they're like, eh, no, not interested. If you had that candidate pool represented on the far right, you would have a whole different group of people to choose from. And I would argue that those folks in the top four, those are the most special. But what happens is we make a hiring decision based on the best possible available candidate we have instead of high performing people. So we wanna to get to a paradigm where we're attracting people that are amazing and so we have a better choice. So you raised your hands. So here's some of the symptoms we see in organizations that are having these kinds of problems. You're distracted about people problems. Instead of worrying about customer issues or innovation, you're dealing with people problems. 
You have pressure over open positions. It's causing overtime, it's causing morale issues, et cetera. You're hearing from your team, we need to offer a higher salary. We need a market analysis to offer more money. We need more stronger benefits or something. You're hearing, you know, we just can't find the right people. Common complaint. Or you're going to an outside agency and now there's frustration because you're being told you're gonna to pay 20, 25% of annual salary or compensation for the placement. Okay, these are just some of the symptoms. But as I was trying to explain before, there are symptoms all over the place that create consequences. And that's typically where our attention goes because the scorecards turn yellow and then red and boom, it gets attention. But if we start to dig deeper, like a, a lean five whys methodology of why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? We start to come up with something that looks more like root cause. And once we have that identified, then we start to address both the problems, the symptoms, and the consequences. So unfortunately, most of the solutions that are out there focus on all of the symptoms. Oh, and it's super profitable to focus on symptoms. There are a lot of solutions you can choose from. There is a plug-in for every part of your talent supply chain process that will improve some aspect of the talent supply chain, whether it's sourcing or online evaluations or automations or video interviews. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. How, how do you deal with that? And then you've got enterprises that buy all this technology and plug it all together. Now we have more AI solutions. Doesn't matter. If you're not attracting people, you're not gonna actually make the hires you want. So we're gonna talk for the remainder of this time about five shifts that we saw occurring in the marketplace. And as we're watching, so I've been doing this for almost 15 years, just employer branding with 20 plus years in the space. These shifts are not mine. We're actually looking at things that I've seen over years. So I was with Accenture for nine years, managed all HR outsourcing in North America for global organizations, uh, big, big clients, Kimberly Carr, uh, TSA, Transportation Security Administration, GMAC Financial, Capital One, big organizations. So I have a, a plethora of background to choose from. And then since 2011, I've been working mostly with small to mid-market organizations. And having the opportunity to consult in more than 35 different industries over years gives you amazing perspective. Those of you that are consultants know that that is like secret sauce to your value proposition because you have so much breadth of experience and knowledge. So that's where this is coming from. I'm going to introduce you to something because I'm going to refer to it over and over again. And that's what I'm going to consider the talent supply chain. This is uh, a process where we're going to, try to contact potential candidates. We're gonna use email, sourcing, social media, job postings, et cetera. You know, everything gets thrown into the funnel. And the application tracking system, applicant tracking system is gonna handle all the activity, and then they're gonna go through first interview, second interview, third interview, and all the way through to contingent offer letter and so on. The weakest link in this chain determines the strength of the chain not rocket science. So if you have an amazing candidate going through this process, but you have a hiring manager that completely turns off that individual, it's over. The chain breaks right at that one point. So every part of this thing has got to be tight. I remember I was at an American Staffing Association conference a few years ago where this lady spoke. Her name is Susan Urschler. And she's got the title of the only person who with her husband has climbed all of the seven highest peaks on all seven continents of the world. And she's a sales manager by history. And so she's all about accomplishment and achievement. But she actually told the story of getting up to the top of Everest and asking one of the Sherpas, hey, what are all those little red colorful flags over there on that other peak? And he explained, well, those are memorial flags to people that have died on the descent from the mountain. Because some percentage of folks get to the top of Everest and realize, oh no, we got to the wrong peak. The true peak is right there, a quarter of a mile away, and we're at the top of the false peak. So after two years and tens of thousands of dollars in investment and training, 
they now have 15 minutes of disappointment before they got to get back down, start the descent. And the Sherpa explains that the discouragement that sets in is so disheartening that on the way down, they don't have the fortitude, the drive, the attention to be able to handle the difficult descent. But those people that get to the top of the right peak, They've got the rush of being on top of the world. They get the selfie with the flags and the mountains in the background. And they are so pumped up that they have the adrenaline physiologically needed and the psychological boost to be able to successfully get back down. Makes sense. So I was thinking, how often are we successfully climbing the wrong mountain? We filled the position. We hired the person. We closed the requisition. Recruiting looks great. It's green. Speed to fill. Time. Cost to fill looks wonderful, but we got the wrong person. We successfully achieved the wrong thing. And it really got me started thinking about this problem. How do we get the right people instead of accidentally getting the wrong people into the mix? So I'm going to go over five shifts that we have seen consistently, and we're going to walk through all five of them right now. The first one that we see is a, sh a shift that organizations started to make years ago, and we're gonna call it experiential constancy. That is a extremely purposeful and intentional experience created for the candidate that walks them through a process, the complete life cycle, in a very consistent way, from the beginning to end. And every word here is important. Create, it's intentional. Experiential, it's the candidate's experience all the way through. And constancy is the integrity in all of the messaging and the experiences. You can't send a great email and have a great first interview and then have a terrible interview with a manager. It's got to be consistent all the way through. So here's the problem. <laughs> we go back to that talent supply chain. We have the candidate becomes aware of the job. They express interest. They consider the job and then they finally decide that they're going to apply. They go from being a candidate to an applicant. And if they get the job opportunity, they're a contingent candidate because they're going to get a contingent offer letter. And then they become a new hire. At what point do they become a high performing person? Not until they're onboarded and they master performance and then they become an advocate for the business. That is a long process. And at any point in there, the candidate could disengage or decide I made the wrong choice, bad decision. It reminds me of the whole storming, forming, norming, performing process that teams go through when they are put together. And unfortunately, this fails for a lot of organizations because the consistency throughout the process is not the same. So the typical model is you have different people in different departments with different processes, with different metrics and different software, all managing different parts of that talent supply chain. There is, in uh, Lean Six Sigma, there's something called a, uh, a, uh, a, pro a process stream owner. And that's somebody that owns the entire process end to end. There's typically not in the talent supply chain of an organization. And this causes high performers to completely disengage. And the higher the performing candidate, the stronger they are, the more critical they are. And if you're failing to deliver this consistent candidate experience, they're not going to be in your applicant pool. They're going to be like that graphic on the left where they're just not even going to be available. So when the candidate, on the other hand, experiences this amazing process and experience, the company appears trustworthy, believable, genuine, and it's what the best people are looking for because they're not just looking for a job. The best people are not just looking for a job. So if your goal is to hire real high performing people, this has to get fixed. Otherwise, it's going to fail because the candidate, just like the recruiter, is interviewing your company. They're going through a process of evaluation to determine if you're the kind of organization they want to work for the same way you're deciding if you want them. So here's the reason why this is so complex and why it's not happening in most organizations. When we look at what creates the brand reputation of the business, it's a lot. First of all, it has to be consistent with the core values. It's got to be consistent with the internal brand. That's what the inside people know about the business. 
And then it's got to be consistent with the external perception. But all of these places are places where there's evidence that either you have consistency or not. You have candidate messaging, you have job postings, you've got public information on your websites, you have corporate stories, you have things that are posted on Facebook. I mean, it is everywhere. And this is a lot of stuff. When we do an assessment of an organization's employer brand strength, we have almost 300 data points we look at to identify weak places in the chain. Here's a quick example. This is a company called Logisticorp. It's a composite of several companies with about 450 employees. And they originally came to us because they had won a contract and they were going to have to re-badge about 65 people. And they were really concerned that these people, these incumbents, were not going to want to come on board this organization. They're a mid-sized organization here in Dallas. They service about 14 different states as a, a company, a fam family of companies. And they said, we need to fix the employee's perception of who we are so that we can get these people because we need 80% of the incumbents to come on board. So what we did was we went through, we did an assessment, we looked at all the different places where they have poor candidate experience and we just cleaned it all up. We just rebuilt everything for the team. And they were able to then bring on board all of those people. I think they had like over 90% that said, yeah, we're in. We, we love the, the, the benefits, we love the culture, we love how you're communicating to us, we love how you're talking to us respectfully. It's all baked in, and we were able to help them with that. If they didn't have the lead time to kind of fix the brand reputation and the messaging, it would have been a lot more ugly. But because they had lead time, it made a big difference. The second shift is what I'm going to call leading. That means you start the conversation with two-way, two-way, not one-way, authentic communication. So what does that mean? We have a lot of data out there that shows that people lie on their resume. Um, how do you find that? Um, this is actually increasing. It's getting worse. And now with ChatGPT creating resumes, it's getting even more exciting to figure out what's true and what's not true. And going all the way back to 2017, 75% of managers catch lies on resumes. Now it's worse. So, I'm going to suggest that companies lie on their resume also. You want to put your best foot forward, and so you deliver only limited information to candidates. You hide everything that's bad so they can't see it. The problem is they can find out everything on their own. They can find out your 401k filings, they can find your lawsuits, they can find, file, find your unemployment claims, issues with Texas, I mean, just on and on. They can even find out what's in the coffee room, okay? They can find out the political party of the CEO. Everything is public now. And there's stories, dirt, from prior employees that is on Indeed forever. Good. Nothing's private. So. With, with this in mind, it doesn't do you any good to lie on your resume as a business. That's what I mean by authentic. You've got to be transparent with the organization. This is huge because it builds a relationship with the candidate that increases trust. It's not transactional. So most recruiters, like I mentioned before, can't do this very effectively because they lack the belief themselves. They're like automatons on the phone doing the screening interviews instead of being passionate about what they believe, about their company, the opportunity, the market. So ultimately, if you want to attract high-performing people, and that's what this conversation is about, not about just filling jobs. If you want to attract high-performing people, this shift, two-way, authentic, transparent communication has to impact all lines of communication with the candidate. So here's an example of a company, uh, commercial electric installation. So all they do are commercial buildings and condominiums and apartment complexes, a uh, couple hundred employees, uh, locally based uh, offices in Houston, Dallas, and they had a problem with just recruiting. They wanted to hire people that were a good cultural fit. And I remember interviewing the, the CEO, uh, Mike Meyerhofer, 
And I found out that he had this, this real strong conviction about taking care of his people. And I, I thought, okay, noted. But it didn't show up anywhere on their website or in their job postings. They were just typical job postings. Duties, responsibilities, three lines of benefits, and apply here. Uh, I found out that they were building a new building. And I said, oh, awesome, Grand Prairie, you know, tell me about that. And he said, well, we've got three offices in the Metroplex, and we really want to create a culture where everyone feels like they're a family, they're part of something special, we build relationships, and we drive long-term community within our organization. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't hear that from CEOs very often. Usually it's all about the financials. So I said, you know what, I think there's something here. Have you ever communicated this publicly? He said, no, no, we're still in the process of finishing out the building. I said, you know, I think this is an amazing story because you're gonna find people that work for corporate behemoths that don't wanna work in an organization where they're a number. They wanna work in an organization where they're valued as a person. And I think that this story is something that would really be attractive to the right people. So he allowed us to craft messaging around this story so that when we're talking to candidates, we can actually share with them, look, this is proof in the pudding of why the culture is different from where you're coming from. And it was true. It attracted people that just fell in love with the cultural concept and what the CEO was trying to accomplish. So simple, two-way authentic communication. Okay, third one. Now, I'm going to call this the secret weapon because it is so powerful, you can almost use it in a manipulative way. And so you have to have the ethics and integrity that go with this. We steal this from the sales and marketing industry where you get personalized emails. So when you go on Amazon, you get personalized recommendations based on your browsing and purchase history, right? Well, if we know something about our ideal candidate, we're going to create messaging that is so on target with what they think and what they feel that they're gonna hear angels singing when they read the job description. That's persona marketing. So it is what I believe the most powerful talent attraction strategy in use today because it tailors all of the messaging to the right candidates. We just recently completed a, an avatar assessment of the workforce of an organization with about 400 employees. And what we, sh what we found was there were two communities of people. There was an older group that were degreed and experienced, and then there was a younger group that were really passionate about their, their career, and they were young college grads. These are the two most high-performing people in the organization. So we realized from the avatar assessment process that our marketing and our conversation needs to resonate with one of these two groups of people. And if we do that effectively, it's a huge difference. So the old way, remember the post and pray? This is how 90% of candidate, candidates are hired. You buy the job postings, you just post stuff on social media. Everyone thinks social media is the holy grail. And yeah, you do get some people, but are they the right people? You have improved job descriptions and competitive pay. All this is components of the post and pray method. And it, it works, you fill jobs. People are looking for J-O-Bs. And so they come to work for you. There's a different way, uh, but unfortunately this is normalized. And this is what I call the recruiting funnel of waste because it's the only department in a company where you can have 90% waste and it's acceptable because what happens? We go to all of these different places to find people and it's just on and on and on recruiting and we throw all these candidates into the funnel. They're all assessed and we interview them. Fewer people go to second interview, fewer people go to third interview, but one person gets all the way through the process and makes it to being a new hire. So out of 100 candidates, we have 99% waste and one person gets the job. And that's somehow great. I have a whole separate training I do on how to get more value from this process, like evangelists, referrals, sales referrals, sales leads. It's absolutely fascinating when you can monetize 
this process and not just throw away all the red because every one of those people in red may have something negative to say about your recruiting process and that's going to be public so mark um, yes sir chad before the meeting started he's looking at you know the process of paying recruiters the 25 percent or whatever to find candidates does that really affect this or is that just one more way of attracting no the staffing organizations kind of do it the same way you got to get into the executive headhunting space where you start to see really tailored messaging well-crafted content personalized messages and very specific recruiting strategies with assessments and profiles and things that's where you see see what we did was like i told you I didn't come up with this stuff. <laughs> we stole it from all these different places and said, let's apply this to the normal recruiting process because everybody's important, not just the managers and above. But uh, if you still have negatives out there and a bad uh, communication culture, even the, the, the paid recruiter is gonna have problems, right? Yeah, the staffing organizations will have the same problem because as soon as the candidate is introduced to who the company is, they're gonna go do their research. And then that's when things fall apart. So the, the new way is using candidate persona marketing where we're delivering exclusive messaging targeted to the mind and the heart of the ideal person for the job. And we're leading with authentic communication that resonates with them. And we're, we're wanting a conversation. What's really funny is it really makes candidates open up about who they are, their struggles, their difficulties, their past, their failures, what they've learned. If you're transparent, they become more transparent too. It's super fascinating. It gives us the ability to rank and rate people that are highly engaged. Most people don't experience this where you have lots of people that are really engaged. They really want to come to work for your company. It's, it's transformational. So this is a whole different process, and it works with high performers very effectively. Because again, they're not looking for a job, they're looking for something that's highly differentiated. So this is not just communication. Don't th think that you can go just change your emails and change your job postings. It's everything and how it gets communicated. It's connecting with people using transparency and honesty, and it's showing them Take away, I should have this in red. It's showing them what they want for their career, for their job, for their eight hours a day they're gonna give you away from their family and what's in it for them, with them. So when we strategically communicate these messages, it repels the wrong people. That's the great thing. You, you be real transparent, you be real honest and the wrong people will say, oh, that's not for me. Awesome, we don't want your application. If you're in state, federal, government, contracts, management, projects, recruiting, you know you've got to keep all of the recruiting records. We don't want records. We don't want any of that. If, they, if we can get them to self-elect out of the process early, that's great. So this is like the shift that we saw years ago when marketing decided that they were going to go from posting newspaper ads to personalized messages transformational difference. Radio ads just blitz the market with messaging versus push communication to you with a personalized email with an offer that, hey, that looks great. That's the difference. So, and that's the reason why this is so powerful. But the reason I call it the secret weapon is because from my experience, just a fraction of companies are using this today. It is maybe 15%. And the cool thing is, if you do this, you could steal anybody. You have the leverage to be able to attract the right people. Here's another case example. From the manufacturing industry, oil and gas, performance pulsation control, not the most exciting business, but super important, something we all rely on. They create the pumps and the connectors and the equipment for uh, oil and gas fields uh, in uh, West Texas. And they have a, a culture that is just hardcore. You cannot have an error in the field because it blows up and it kills people. So you talk about error free, well this is like defect, defect free environment. But they had a hard time attracting the right people that have the mindset and the cultural fit. So let's talk to the owner. Uh, John Rogers, founder and owner. 
uh, he, he shares with me all this information about their, their culture and their organization. And I find out that he has a, what I would consider almost like a faith-based business. They even have their own nonprofit organization called PPC Cares that collects money from employees only for employees. So if somebody's going through financial difficulty or a hardship, they draw from the coffers of the nonprofit to be able to help those people in need. I mean, that's putting your money where your mouth is. You're demonstrating this real serious commitment to your people. And I just thought, you know, I don't see any of this anywhere in the recruiting messaging. Let's change everything that's being sent. So what you see there, that all those pages, that's an example of a job description. It is not a job description. It is not a job description like you've ever seen. It is something that is compelling, it's differentiating, and it speaks to people, the right people, because it speaks to their heart. So we changed all of their messaging so that they could hire people for their machine shop and work in, their, in the field. I mean, I'm talking like Odessa uh, in the field. And it worked because it made people interested in a business that would have never otherwise been interested. So without going into too much more detail, because I want to cover all of the, the key points, uh, here's a quick recap. Shift number one that we've seen in the marketplace that we now teach and we help affect is experiential constancy, consistent candidate experience. The second is two-way authentic communication and you starting the process. Lead, that means you begin with two-way authentic communication. And then three, use the secret weapon because it's different from what everybody else is doing. Candidate persona marketing. Okay, number four, control and containment. This comes from a Lean Six Sigma concept of if you have something that is blowing up and it's impacting the customer, you better identify that problem and you better mitigate the negative impact of the customer before you go do a root cause analysis and try to fix the process and the procedure, you better fix the customer impact. In this case, the candidate is our customer. If we take this perspective, we're going to go out and control anything that negatively impacts our customer, the candidate, because we don't want them to have a bad experience. And the reason why this is so unique is because it's an operational or Lean Six Sigma discipline or principle using a marketing strategy and a recruiting application. <laughs> Those are completely separate disciplines in an organization. You can't find one person that can have a conversation across that enterprise level discussion unless they're a senior manager. But when we do this, it's transformational. Here's why. How do people shop for goods and services? We go online, right? You're interested in a new restaurant, you're looking for What's their, their points or what's their stars? Uh, do they have a high rating? That's how we make choices today. Well, if somebody's got a low rating, we're not gonna go to the hotel, we're not gonna go, I mean, I just booked a, a flight for this coming weekend to go to Seattle and those stars are everything, sort by stars. Well, that's how people shop for employers today. They go online, they look at the interview information, did you know that some of the interviews with your company can post a public comment, a review on Glassdoor or Indeed? They don't even have to be your employee. And so when, some, when an organization shows up with a low score that's public with anecdotal stories from real people, that's called social proof. Social proof that your company's terrible. And even if you're a great organization, that's what people are paying attention to. Because it's not managed, it's killing you. And 84% of job seekers today say that the public reputation of a business influences where they apply. M most people wouldn't even work for a company if they had the choice, if they have a bad reputation. It, it, it's a killer on your long-term career value also. Like you, you know, if you have like some Enron, <laughs> just to use an example, on your, on your resume and you're an accountant, you know, that's going to be something you're going to address forever for the rest of your life. Okay, so job seekers say that negative interviews significantly damage the brand of the company and they would not work for a company even with more money. Okay, that's fascinating. So 
the inverse is true then. 92% of people say that they would leave their company, aka talent theft, when you're the one thieving the people, if you have an excellent reputation. 67% would even take less pay. 45% would quit for a significant pay reduction if it was a great organization with a great reputation. So if you're the company with the excellent reviews, the online social proof that you're an amazing place to work, this is back to what I introduced as containment and control. Most companies don't manage this. All of that stuff that's collecting out there online is just an amorphous blob of negative information. And because the companies don't do anything to manage it, control and contain its impact on the candidate's perception, the customer, they're getting beat up. And you're not getting high performing people. Because again, the highest performing people are the most discriminating and they do the most research. So even if you get all first three of the shifts correct, you're able to implement all those things successfully, you get this one wrong, it's like the weak link in the chain. But if you get this right, the payoff is huge. It takes a commitment, however, to monitoring all of the negative and damaging events that are accumulating on the internet and then creating and curating them to create positive impact. Hey, that's work. And probably nobody in your company is assigned to it. Here's a good example. <clears throat> Another case study, a smaller organization, uh, less than 75 employees, software, SaaS development firm, specializing in payroll, HR benefits, and they're based out of California, but they've got customers in all 50 states, and most of their employees are recruited from the Southern California space. And they just had challenges with trying to attract people. When we did their initial assessment, <clears throat> what showed up as glaring red is the negative performance and reviews from candidates and employees that were posting negative social comments on social media. It's like, okay this is a brownfield. We need to go clean this up because it doesn't matter how great you are. And we're talking about wonderful people in this company, ethical, just sweet people. I've, I've spent time with their COO, their CEO, their founder, their vice president of sales, great leadership, but bad rap online because it wasn't managed. They weren't controlling and containing it. So we went in and we we started addressing all those public comments and we created a campaign to get the people that love the company, the internal employees that are passionate about the business, go say something publicly. We need those four and five stars because candidates are reading it and they're not getting the correct perception of the company. It's not rocket science, but it, it takes the effort to do it. Okay, shift number five. Don't try to do this alone. Get some help. Get somebody to help your organization <clears throat> that has the expertise in transformation. And we're gonna talk about why. <clears throat> because we've covered a lot of stuff. Realize that it impacts a lot of different teams. Web development, HR, talent acquisition, operations. <clears throat> All these different organizations are impacted. So if you try to absorb the work internally, what happens is there's a lot of blind spots. I tell people all the time, if you had the internal capacity and capability to implement this stuff, it would already be done. The fact that it's glaringly not done is an indication that you don't have the right people in the business. It's not a slight, it's just normal. You hire people to get a job done and they're all sitting in roles. This is a very strategic activity. And most people have operational focus with tactical knowledge, not enterprise level strategic focus. <clears throat> Another problem is lack of ownership. This is my favorite thing to talk about because when we talk to a new company, we'll typically start at the C level and they'll say, oh, uh, you need to talk to somebody in HR. And then HR will say, mm, that sounds like a talent acquisition problem. You need to talk with the TA team. And then talent acquisition team will say, Oh, you're talking about stuff on the internet? No, no, no. You need to talk to the web development team. And then the web development team says, no, 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 we don't control content. We just do the dev work. You need to talk to somebody in 
HR or the CEO's office. And it's like, oh, here we go. Not it, not it, not it. Nobody has responsibility and there's no, there's no owner of the entire process. Then not to mention stakeholder and conflicts of interest. Because remember that talent supply chain with all those loops? Different departments, different silos. Everybody wants their metrics to look good. If you've seen the book called The Goal, written by Eliyahu Goldratt, it's an operational excellence allegory that teaches operational excellence principles. One of the things he shows in there is most organizations suffer from what's called local optima. That is, they optimize individual silos at the expense of the enterprise. Oh, my department's good. We're on budget. Our metrics are green. <laughs> We're killing everybody else. Other problems with this are <clears throat> past practice. We want to keep on doing status quo. Nobody wants to change something if they're going to be held accountable for the results. That's called career risk. Another thing is people don't think out of the box. They, they just don't have the experience to be able to bring these concepts into the business and make these transformational changes. And then the existing team, well, they are stuck in what they're doing. And a lot of times it's just because they're overwhelmed. And we talk about people taking on more work or having overtime issues. Uh, not only do they have limited knowledge, but they're just very, very busy. So when you start to get outside help, and that can come from a lot of different ways, if you're committed to making a change, you're going to invest in the resources to do this right. <clears throat> and it's fun to, to look at what the operational impact is to the organization when you get this stuff done. But when you bring in the right expertise, you get, and you know what, these slides are applicable to any change management conversation, right? You, you have internal capability or you don't. If you gotta go external to your organization, bring somebody in to help you, this is your business case right here. Steal the slides. Prior experience. You want somebody with diverse best practices, experience and knowledge, multi-industry experience to be able to bring out of the box ideas to your organization. You want somebody that knows what works and what doesn't. You want somebody that can bring all the team members together and own it and manage it and not have a biased or siloed point of view and not political, okay? Hard to achieve when it's all done internally. They're also bringing enterprise knowledge of all these different disciplines like we've been talking about today. I mean, we're talking about talent acquisition, HR compliance and policy, organizational design, marketing and communications, change management, operational excellence. That's a lot of separate disciplines. You're not gonna get that in your talent acquisition lead, for example, unless they come from a large organization where they've managed transformation projects. And then of course, speed to implement. <clears throat> you, know, the, uh, you can go online and get uh, instructions in writing or YouTube on how to do do-it-yourself surgery but it's not recommended because it makes a big mess and it costs a lot more money in the long run. Same way, it makes a big mess. The cost, the time to implement things can be very, very expensive. Getting something wrong, if somebody comes in and they have prior experience, whether you hire them eternally or they're an adjunct to your team, they're gonna have powerful frameworks, they're gonna have methodologies, they're gonna have training tools, they're gonna have change management tools and templates to be able to utilize. That's huge. So five key things, shifts that we've seen in the marketplace implemented in different places. When we aggregate all those together, very, very powerful. Candidate experience, consistent experience, <clears throat> two-way authentic communication, candidate persona marketing, controlling and containing all the negative content that's out there and leveraging the right expertise. I'm gonna add a sixth one real quick, <clears throat> just because some of you will appreciate this. Some of you need to pray harder about who, who you're <laughs> hiring because whatever you're doing now is not working. And there's, there's some precedent for this. If you look at, um, I think, 1 Samuel chapter 16 in the Old Testament, uh, Samuel has got a recruiting exercise. Saul, the first king of Israel, has failed as a leader, and he is um, on his way out. And Samuel is given this recruiting activity of go find another leader for the, the state of Israel. And so he goes to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse, and he looks at all these candidates. And the first one, 
Eliab and Abiudab, all of these guys, they all look great on the outside. Technical fit, perfect resume, career background and experience, ooh, good public speaking capabilities, ding, 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 green on the scorecard. And he's praying about this the whole time and God says, no, 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 there's another one. Keep recruiting. And uh, that's why he comes up with David at the very end. Because of David's heart, he gets the job. He gets anointed. There's a lesson there. Don't, don't miss that. Okay, so this stuff needs to change everything in your candidate recruiting experience. When it does, it's going to impact mission, vision, and purpose, how it's communicated, your competitive differentiators. I'm not talking about your products and services your talent differentiators, your value proposition, your EVP to a candidate, your job postings, everything is posted on social media. All this stuff has got to get impacted. <clears throat> so I recommend a process where you determine suitability. How is this going to work? Identify priorities create a business case because you gotta get buy-in from everybody in the organization. You can use this as a blueprint. Create a scope of work that's well-defined with expected outcomes. Use an analysis so that you can point to, hey, this is an empirical assessment. It's not my subjective opinion. We need to fix these things. Get additional discovery. Do that gap analysis. This is a typical consultative approach, but organizations need to do this internally. When you reframe that employer brand in the beginning, now it's going to impact the creation of all the assets that fit into that. Remember that circular picture I showed you with the core values, the internal perception of the brand, the external perception of the brand, and then all that stuff that's publicly accessible? That's where number 10 kicks in. We're optimizing all those assets from the perspective of the candidate and then operationalizing change. And then my favorite from a Demaic perspective is installing governance. Okay, so what can you expect as the ROI? Because you know, either somebody's gonna look at this and say, oh, it's so woo woo, or how do we measure this stuff? Well, you really ought to start to see a higher number of engaged candidates, applicants for jobs. You ought to start seeing a decreased cost of operations in recruiting. Yeah, there's some upfront, work and effort, but it pays off over a long period of time. You ought to also see an elevated internal standard of performance. Because what happens when you hire a high performing person into your team? Like you, you have a sales team and you hire somebody that's now doing 25% more than everybody else. My son, uh, he works for Sewell Lexus downtown. So shout out to Sewell. His name's Braden, by the way. He, uh, he got hired out of Baylor and his first month, uh, he was told you could stay on commission for like seven to nine months as long as you're performing and meeting some level of quota. And he decided that month two, he was going to go 100% commission. <laughs> well, his, his income is like way over six figures. As a Baylor, Baylor grad, he's 20 years old. He can't even like party with the guys and he's kicking it because he is a high performer. The funny thing is, he made all the other new recruits look bad. Even some of the people that had been there for a while, to the point where he's now competing for salesperson of the year for 2024. When you hire people that are high performers, they increase the bar for everybody else. That is fun to watch. Increased value of enterprise contributions. When you have somebody that's high performing, they come in and they say, you know, I don't care about my siloed job. I want to make a difference for the enterprise. And they're making contributions that affect the organization, massive. And of course, other things as well. And we could make this list a lot longer, but you get the idea. There's a timing thing here that I think is important, it's worth addressing, and that is, this concept of shifting to a talent attraction model is still not ubiquitous everywhere. You hear a lot about employer branding, but very few organizations have the discipline to do what I've just described. I think we're still in the early adoption stage. So if we look at the, the uptake model that's coming from uh, Crossing the Chasm, the, uh, the book that shows how change is adopted within a, a society or a culture, 
we're still in the early phase where if you do this as a business, you're really differentiated from other organizations that are competing for the same talent. Give it a few more years where 50, 70% of organizations have now implemented all this stuff, you're not gonna have the same competitive advantage. You have a window of opportunity still now to take advantage of it. So, and you have lots of choices to be able to do this. You can start small uh, or you can go for the gusto. But I have a bunch of resources that we've posted on our website. You can actually go online here. There's a page called Thought Leadership and you can download case studies, examples, all kinds of stuff, and you can kind of see uh, you know, what it takes to get there and accomplish the work. There's even uh, some documentation on creating a path to a, a, an excellent employer brand. So I am happy to take questions because I know that was a lot of content really fast. Mm -hmm.